back to sleep now. <laughs> okay. Welcome, everybody. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing and welcoming Frank Claudiano to give a talk to us. My name is Lisa Dugan, and I'm in the EVP program. A reminder to all you EVPers, please make sure you sign up back on the chair. We have a sign-up sheet so you can get credit for this. Frank, let me tell them a few things about you. Frank Cogliana is Professor of American History at the University of Edinburgh, where he serves as the university's Dean International for North America. During the 2023-24 academic year, he will serve as the Interim Saunders Director of the International Center for Jefferson Studies right here at Monticello. He received his BA in History from Tufts University and earned his MA and PhD in History from Boston University. He has taught at universities in the United States, England, and Scotland, and has been a member of the History Department at the University of Edinburgh since 1997. He has served as the president of the Scottish Association for the Study of America and is the chair of the program committee of the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. Cogliano, excuse me, Cogliano was elected as a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in 1999 and is a member of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts in 2022 a specialist in the history of the American Revolution and the early United States. He is the author and editor of nine books, including Thomas Jefferson, Reputation and Legacy, published in 2006, The Blackwell Companion to Jefferson, published in 2012, and Emperor of Liberty, Thomas Jefferson's Foreign Policy, published in 2014. His Revolutionary America, 1763 to 1815, A Political History, is now in its fourth edition. A colleague at a British university, not the University of Edinburgh, however, once described it as, and I quote, the book my students plagiarized the most. <laughs> In February 2024, Harvard University Press will publish his next book entitled Revolutionary Friendship, Washington, Jefferson, and the American Republic, along with Patrick Griffin, Krista Derricksheide, and Elega Gould, he edits the Revolutionary Age series for the University of Virginia Press. Frank Cogliona is committed to engaging a wide audience with the study of history. For many years, he was a workshop leader for school teachers, and he co-hosts the American history broadcast, The Whiskey Rebellion. He is incoming president of the Open History Society in Edinburgh. He has made numerous media appearances, commenting on US history, politics, and international relations for the BBC and other outlets. He has made multiple appearances on the BBC's flagship In Our Time program. Frank, welcome to Monticello. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. The first thing I'm going to do is step down. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, and uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's great to see so many uh, people I know and so many friends in the audience and people who will become friends in the course of this year. I'm really, really thrilled to be here. Uh, they tested me about waving my arms around and trying not to be too excited, so I will try not to uh, become too excited so I can uh, don't disturb our colleagues in the back. So what I want to talk to you about is building on one of those books that Lisa mentioned, the book I wrote about Thomas Jefferson's reputation, which was published in 2006. Uh, and what I uh, propose to do today for you guys is to update some of what I had to say there. But before I do that, I want to say something to colleagues in EVP. First of all, yes, please sign up because you want credit for this if you're going to sit through it. But secondly, I just want to acknowledge the really, really important work you all do because basically none of us would be here if you didn't do that work. Um, this place depends on the work you do, but more, it's not just about that. It's also about the work you do communicating with the public. I guarantee you that you communicate with far more people than I do through those books that I've written and edited, read by tens of people. <laughs> 
even my wife's given up reading them at this point. Um, <laughs> you all communicate to hundreds of thousands of people every year. And that work is so important. And you convey what this place is about and what Jefferson's about and what how complicated Jefferson's legacy is. And that's the vital work. You know, we at ICJS do a lot of work and I've got wonderful colleagues there producing scholarship, but you're the people. Scholarship in isolation is fine, but it only works, you know, if a tree falls in the woods, if nobody hears it, it doesn't make a sound. Um, it only works because of the work you and other colleagues and teachers do communicating to broader audiences. So I want to begin by kind of acknowledging that work and thanking you for that work. So what I want to do today, I'm going to begin with a quote. We always do that at Monticello. It's like church. Uh, <laughs> however, I'm going to deviate. I'm not beginning with a Jefferson quote. I'm beginning with a quote about Jefferson, and you'll know this one too. In fact, we need this one on tea towels, mugs, and t-shirts as well, because we always use this all the time. It's, of course, James Parton's 1874 quote, if Jefferson was wrong, then America is wrong. If Jefferson is, sorry, if America is right, Jefferson was right. You'd think such a well-known quote, I'd get it right. Um, and to a certain extent, that's the theme of the book I wrote about Jefferson's reputation. That's the theme of my talk tonight, in the sense that for whatever reason, and we can talk about the reasons, I'm going to leave time for questions at the end, um, why this is that Jefferson bears this historical burden that we, I'm using the kind of royal we here, uh, have imposed on him both during his lifetime and in the 200 years since his death, or nearly 200 years since his death, that you know Jefferson is assessed and Jefferson's reputation has to bear the kind of burden of what we, and now I'm saying we in the sense of Americans, think about America at any given time. And so what we've seen in the two centuries since Jefferson's death, and I'm certainly not the only person who's written about this, the person who's written most perceptively about this remains Merrill Peterson. You know, but in the two centuries since Jefferson's death, you know, Jefferson's reputation's gone up and down. And those fluctuations pretty much go hand in hand with whatever we're talking about in our contemporary politics. And I'm going to reflect on the past 20 years or so and how that's been the case um, and, and offer some thoughts about this. To a certain extent, I think colleagues who are here from EVP are wasting their time because my, my takeaway for you is you need to try and ignore all this political nonsense around Jefferson and do your jobs. And I have a incredible amount of sympathy for you in trying to do that because what I'm going to describe is the environment that makes your jobs so hard. So basically, this is a love letter to you. This is an uplifting pat on the back for you, but I'm not sure what you can actually take away from it apart from the fact that I understand at some level how difficult your jobs are. So, and I also want to say that this is, one, what I'm going to be talking a lot about politics here and I'm going to be citing political figures, this doesn't break down uh, very easily, doesn't map very well on contemporary partisanship uh, for all kinds of reasons. Again, I'm happy to talk about that at the end as well. Um, yet, there's an attempt sometimes to either appropriate or push Jefferson away in light of our contemporary political concerns. But I don't think it maps very well on contemporary politics or in the way or it doesn't Jefferson doesn't map very simply on our contemporary politics, despite the efforts of people to do so. And I've got two recent examples to illustrate this. Very recent from the past few weeks. So recently, Vivek Ramaswamy invoked Jefferson to appeal to Gen Z voters which is an interesting flex in and of itself. I mean, all of these examples are really interesting because they, you know, if we try to unpack them, you think, well, what's going on there? And I've got my favorite weird example coming, so pay attention. But so just a couple of weeks ago, Ramaswamy invoked Jefferson basically to answer the criticism that he's too young and inexperienced to be president. And he said, I believe he's 38. He said, well, Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Before that, a couple of weeks before that, Al Sharpton invoked Jefferson and Madison on MSNBC in discussing January 6th and Donald Trump's legal problems around 
January 6. What's interesting about this, if you really want to dig down, is Fox News ran with this for most of the day, more or less to say what a bad historian Al Sharpton is. It was, it was a slightly... So we have Sharpton invoking Jefferson in a seemingly sympathetic way, basically saying, in order to understand what January 6 was about, imagine if Thomas Jefferson and James Madison sought to overthrow the government. And uh, Fox News believed this was a way to criticize MSNBC and Al Sharpton. Again, we don't, we don't want to get into this stuff. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not taking a position in, in, our, in terms of our contemporary politics, except to say that what we see is people as dissimilar as Vivek Ramaswamy and Al Sharpton invoke Jefferson within a few days of each other uh, with, in, during this month. So, so what I want to show, so, so just to kind of go through things, uh, I want to briefly say, to prove my point, Jefferson has either been invoked or, or, or has been associated with every single president of the 21st century. And I want to just give you an examples of each to prove that, I, that I'm telling the truth here. Uh, and then I want to, I, I, as I see it, there are kind of two real, two really good examples and interesting streams when it comes to Jefferson's reputation in this, the 21st century. And I'll elaborate on those. But let me first just give you this kind of broad overview or these examples to illustrate this point. So on Jefferson's birthday in 2001, George W. Bush, you may remember, hosted a meeting at the White House and issued a proclamation, basically a happy birthday, Thomas Jefferson proclamation. The media at, at that, attending that ceremony, were descendants of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And so this actually attracted a lot, generated a fair bit of news in April of 2001 because uh, President Bush was acknowledging and accepting what the foundation had recently accepted at that point, the relationship between Jefferson and Hemings. And George W. Bush memorably said at that ceremony, no wonder America sees itself in Thomas Jefferson. So as I said, there's a kind of protean nature to Thomas Jefferson, that he, he, he kind of serves the moment for whatever argument people are seeking to make. And in this case, President Bush was basically arguing, hey, look, Thomas Jefferson, he's the founding father of multicultural America. So it's a generally positive view. President Obama, Jefferson was invoked a lot during the Obama years. Uh, this is an example from a friend of the foundation, uh, John Meacham, which he wrote in, in, uh, when he was promoting his book back in 2012. But he's basically saying, look, Jefferson can learn, or sorry, Obama can learn from Jefferson's legacy, and there's something that, that Obama can, can uh, take from Jefferson. So this was 2012. 2017, soon after... President Trump was inaugurated in February. We've got memo to Thomas uh, Donald Trump. Thomas Jefferson invented hating the media. It's amazing when you track this stuff, the stuff that Jefferson is credited with. Macaroni and cheese, hating the media. It's, it's an endless list. And Joe Biden. It's a little unfair because Joe Biden, of course, went to school with Thomas Jefferson. But, <laughs> but how Joe Biden is like America's founding fathers. And no, I'm not kidding. These are the lessons he can learn. So this is totally nonpartisan. Everybody does it. It happens with every single administration. I guarantee you that when President Taylor Swift is inaugurated in 1837, uh, 19, 2037, somebody will invoke Thomas Jefferson. There are two main themes that I see, though, in, in, these, uh, in, in the kind of first decades of the 21st century that I want to illustrate. One of them is genuinely strange and a little bit surprising, and it's the way Jefferson has been invoked to justify American foreign policy. So that's the first of the themes I want to explore. The other will be more predictable and, I guess, uh, not surprising to you, which is Jefferson as an object in the ongoing kind of American discourse or fight about race and identity. But the, the former, the first one is the kind of foreign policy piece of it. And it's more or less summed up in that headline from the CNN piece that appeared in 2014, how Thomas Jefferson would have handled ISIS. You guys as guides must get this all the time. What does Jefferson think about tort reform? What does Jefferson think about plumbing? What does Jefferson, well, it's a shame Bill Barker's not here to tell us the questions he gets. But so in this case, we get, this is how Jefferson would have handled ISIS. 
And the subheads there are important. You may not be able to see them, so I apologize for that. But, you know, under story highlights, President Obama launched strikes on ISIS in Syria without congressional approval. Second one, Thomas Jefferson launched war on the Barbary pirates without congressional approval. So this is a direct link between the two. And actually, in the book I wrote that Lisa mentioned on Jefferson's foreign policy, I actually have a chapter in there. Jefferson's decision-making around the Barbary War is actually quite interesting, but this is a fairly facile connection being made between the two. This took a bizarre turn, though, in 2015. In November of 2015, you may remember there was a series of pretty horrible attacks by ISIS in Paris in November of 2015. So what interests me about this example is it kind of cropped up... Um, in another context, this didn't directly relate to the United States in this case. Nonetheless, Simon Sharma, who's a historian who may be familiar to you, a very famous kind of public intellectual, he's a British historian uh, of all kinds of things, has written a little bit about the United States, but he's mainly a European historian, wrote an essay in the Financial Times um, immediately after those events. So this appeared on November 15, 2015 in the Financial Times. And I apologize. Well, I've, got, I've Lisa's a teacher. She'll know I'm breaking all the rules. There's way too much text on this, and you can't see it. But what's germane is the, the header, of the, the beginning of the second paragraph, where he writes, Shama writes, until Friday night, I thought the pursuit of happiness, an anomaly among the self-evident truths in the American Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson's hallmark greeting card sentiment, ouch, <laughs> seems unnecessary, uh, beside the bigger nostrums of life and liberty. And then he goes on to basically say, the, uh, basically there's a war going on, a war of ideas between ISIS and uh, Islamic fundamentalism and the West. And he's just, so he's invoking Jefferson um, on, the kind of, on the side of Western civilization in this example. The reason I cite that, and again, it, I apologize for the, the small size of the print, is because in response to that, a reader to the Financial Times, a guy from New York, basically wrote, yes, Jefferson wrote those nice words that we all possess, uh, possess rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They are reassuring. However, it should be noted that when Jefferson was faced with the murderous and enslaving actions of the Barbary pirates, he did not pen more ideals, but rather sent a naval force to combat the menace. And this theme is really, really consistent. I could come up with multiple examples, or has been ever since 2001, 9-11. This comes up repeatedly, especially since there have been a spate of books about the Barbary War that appeared in the, in the first decade of this century and... Um, and well, and basically in the past 20 years. And so this is a very, very consistent theme. We're left with a rather bizarre Jefferson for those of us who've studied Jefferson's life because Jefferson is not, prior to 9-11, was not generally presented as, a fair, as an advocate of a fairly um, militant foreign policy. I mean, he used to be criticized for those naval gunboats, you know, the, 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 the gunboats and a halfway pacifist, he was called by one, one historian. But in the 21st century, we have a much more kind of aggressive, robust Jefferson that emerges, at least in the popular mind, including from this gentleman. Now, again, I almost deleted this slide because it feels a little bit, it feels unfair to cite a kind of Georgia state representative from eight years ago. I don't even know whether he's still in office, but this appeared in the, he wrote this as a letter right after the ISIS attacks in Paris, and he wrote it. Um, uh, anyway, it feels, <laughs> he's a public figure and, and he wrote it in public. So in that sense, I'm okay. And this was from his website or the image is from his website. And he's a self-described Reagan Republican Christian conservative. Those aren't my words. Those are his. However, basically what he says is Jefferson wasn't afraid to, it's, it's a version of, wasn't afraid to confront radical Islam. He even read the Quran, he notes, which I think is interesting. And then he kind of, um, they hate us because we're free, and Thomas Jefferson knew that, which is why he pursued the Barbary War. But not, I mean, this is just yet another example. It's not the one I really want to show you. This is the one you will not forget. <laughs> I, I collect these things. Let me warn you some, about something. This probably won't be the only time this year I show this to you. <laughs> 
Because believe it or not, sometimes academics double dip and repeat themselves. <laughs> The kind of reconfiguring Jefferson in the 21st century as a kind of action hero reached its most absurd point with a blog post by Chuck Norris, the movie star. And so what we have is a wonderful headline, Chuck Norris, TJ knew how to deal with thugs and hooligans, but that's not all. So we have a summary of this. Chuck Norris calls for similar, so citing President Jefferson's historic battle against the Barbary pirates, Chuck Norris calls for similar action against present day, quote, sea radicals. Read why Walker, Texas Ranger, wants the United States to deliver, and this is the coup de grace here, a Thomas Jefferson style roundhouse kick to the Somali pirates this time instead of the Barbary pirates who menace commercial ships off the, Afri uh, the African coast. Anyway, the voices of our four, and uh, Norris is quoted, the voices of our four, their forefathers cry out from the Barbary Wars in the hopes of imparting some wisdom to us. As the adage goes, we will either learn from history's mistakes or be doomed to repeat them. I'll return to this at the end. Um, now, Chuck Norris, I want to make clear, every, the, the great thing about Jefferson and the reason hundreds of thousands of people come here is because Everybody's interested. Everybody owns Jefferson. We don't own Jefferson. We're not here to protect Jefferson's reputation. That's not our jobs. Uh, but the fact that everybody feels invested in Jefferson is both great, but also can take us to some slightly strange places. And again, I'm not here to criticize Chuck Norris, apart from the Thomas Jefferson style roundhouse kicks. I don't know what that is. Um, maybe we're missing a trick and we should be selling a Thomas Jefferson action doll in the, in the, in the shop. Um, I, I am going to ask Bill Barker to do a roundhouse kick. <laughs> so we get that. And this is a, this is a totally, you know, in writing about Jefferson's reputation, the ebbs and flows are fairly predictable and they can be mapped pretty easily. And the themes that come up, democracy, race, states' rights, etc., are pretty consistent. This is totally new. This is a totally new variant that really is a product of this century. So one reason why I'm belaboring it isn't just because I wanted to show you this, but also because this is the, the first kind of new variant as far as something to say about Jefferson and this. But this has become, as I hope I've shown you, a bit of a commonplace. I mean, although it's new, it's taken root and it comes up a lot, even you know, in response to a tax in Paris that have nothing to do with the United States. So that's one theme. Jefferson's reputation has, it always goes up and down. I had a discussion with a good friend at Monticello about Hamilton a few years ago, soon after Hamilton came out, and this person expressed some concern that Hamilton, the musical, not the individual, although it does apply to the individual, was mean to Jefferson. You know, it, I disagree with this, actually, because I think Jefferson's the star of Act Two of Hamilton, and we should all be so lucky as to be portrayed by David Diggs. I'd take that if I were Jefferson. Um, but there was there has been a turning. I would say the general trajectory of Jefferson's reputation in this century, with the notable exception of the roundhouse kicks to Islamic radicals, has been downward. This is not an up period for Jefferson's reputation. I think that, I think I'm on safe ground saying that. I don't think Hamilton produced that, but Hamilton could be seen as a kind of marker in that. If only because if you want a, a kind of very simple way to map reputations and this is this does kind of work over the over the centuries. When Ham, when Hamilton, not the musical, the individual is up, Jefferson tends to be down. Not always, but but usually. And we're in a period of Hamilton being up, the musical contributing to that. So in that sense, maybe this headline from the Atlantic is correct. I don't think he's quite the villain of the uh, of Hamilton. Um, sure, uh, Aaron Burr is the villain of Hamilton. Yeah. He kills him. <laughs> but Hamilton, I, I just cite this because it's Hamilton and you never go wrong citing it. Trust me, with students these days, if you don't mention Hamilton, you're dead. I had a student, this is offline, right, Ian? Nobody's seeing this, right? <laughs> At Edinburgh, I was giving my lecture about the American Revolution or one of them, and somebody came up to me and said, 
yeah, Professor, that was great, but you didn't mention Hercules Mulligan. And I said, well, Hercules Mulligan's not, I mean, it's not that important, but this was somebody who'd seen Hamilton and said, no, 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 you're wrong about that. My daughter went to see Hamilton. My daughter loves the theater. She lives in London. I brought her to Monticello, and she was lecturing me about Jefferson based on what she learned from Hamilton. She said, well, you know, and I said, well, I do know, actually. <laughs> but, although, in fairness, when she saw Hamilton, she said, maybe what you do is interesting. So you take the good with the bad. Um, on the other hand, this is a down period for Jefferson, not just because Hamilton is up, but because we're having, we're in a fa fairly dark place in the national discourse on race. There's no, I think that's a safe statement. And I don't need to remind the people in this room what happened in Charlottesville six years ago. And that a key element in that horrible weekend was the march on the grounds at UVA and the protest, you know, the, the, the Unite the Right uh, demonstrators claimed that they were protecting the statue of Thomas Jefferson on grounds. And that, that was on the Friday night before the killing on the Saturday and all the violence on the Saturday, but it, you know, it wasn't a good start to the weekend. Um, a month later, there was a protest on the grounds about that statue from Black Lives Matter protesters who shrouded the statue. And I want to make one thing very, very clear here. I'm not suggesting for a second that there's equivalency between these two demonstrations and what they were doing. I'm using this to illustrate the fact that Jefferson is an object in our ongoing debate about race, but I'm not equating the Black Lives Matter protest with the Unite the Right protest, except in so far as both focused on that particular space and that image of Jefferson. And so as part of that ongoing discussion, you know, Jefferson's in for a rough time and I would can say to you, he deserves to be, you know, race is not a good topic for Thomas Jefferson, as any of, as all of you who've read the notes on the state of Virginia will know. Yet, Jefferson, as is often the case, my theme here, if you're, if there's one to take away, often becomes the object he's invoked, or the subject, I should say, in our current political discourse. So I'm not sure everyone who's concerned about Jefferson or invokes Jefferson in this debate is necessarily concerned about what Jefferson has to say so much as seeking to score political points. And frankly, twas ever thus. That's the history of, the, of Jefferson's reputation. President Trump, in his infamous news conference of August 15, 2017, this is the people on both sides news conference, said, so, this week, it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? Jefferson was a major slave owner. Are we going to take down his statue? Of President Trump's many forays into American history, this is actually one of the more accurate ones. I mean, his statement about Jefferson is correct. And since 2017, especially since the summer of 2020 and the, the murder of George Floyd, we have been having a debate as a culture about race and statues and the statues of people who are problematic. And President Trump was somewhat prescient in this. There's a lot of whataboutery here, or, you know, it's sort of saying, you know, reductio ad absurdum in saying, okay, well, if you take down Robert E. Lee, then Jefferson is next. Statues of Jefferson have come down. And famously, there was the removal of the statue from uh, the New York City Council Chambers. Statues and the history of statues, I'm happy to have us discuss those. I think, I think they're fascinating and who gets commemorated and why. What's interesting about statues to me is their statements, not as with all of these examples, their statements not about the individuals concerned always, but the period, the people at the time, people who erect monuments and statues are making statements themselves. And so in this sense, putting up statues is not unlike the other cultural artifacts I've cited to you, whether it's politicians citing people or people trying to link politicians with particular individuals. So when that statue in the New York City Council Chambers was put up to celebrate Jefferson's 
advocacy of religious freedom and the separation of church and state, which is part of Jefferson's legacy that we rightly celebrate. And it was put up at a time when there was mass immigration to the United States, especially New York, of many people who were non-Christian. So it was a state, it was a statement in and of in and of its time about Jefferson and invoking Jefferson to make a particular political statement. As was taking it down, and they put it in storage, they didn't destroy it, uh, but taking it down was a statement about the politics of this moment, which are complicated, especially where race is concerned. And so that's, I guess, the observation I would make. And we're in the midst of this prolonged discussion about how we reckon the past with the present and how we do so, particularly where the question of race is concerned. It's not clear how this is going to go. It's a never-ending discussion in this country. It's probably not going to be sorted. You know, we're never going to get a day where everybody says, okay, that's it. We're done with that. Let's move on. Um, and Jefferson will always figure because his legacy is complicated in this. He did fervently oppose slavery. He did enslave at least 607 people. He did believe in human equality. He did say horribly racist things that are difficult to explain away in the notes in the state of Virginia. And so as a consequence of that, he's always going to be in that conversation. And this is the context in which I began by praising you all, and I have a huge amount of respect for the work you do, because it's very difficult for you to do that, do that work in this context. You all have more experience of Jefferson's changing re reputation than I do. And I bet you, you know, you, you've got it, you know, your fingers are on the pulse. You know, you can really um, measure it. So we're left with, and this is where I want to invoke one of the great historical thinkers of our time, Chuck Norris, who warned us that if we don't know history, we're doomed to repeat it with this, which is one of my favorite cartoons. I like to share this with students as well. There's the wise old professor there on the left. I used to identify with that guy, but now I identify with that guy. That's the way it goes. <laughs> those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Yet those who do study history are doomed to stand by helplessly while everyone else repeats it. <laughs> and it feels like we're doing that sometimes. So what's your takeaway as people who engage in the really important work of public history? which to my way of thinking is civic education, and it's incredibly important. It's impossible to, I really think it's unbelievably powerful and important what you're doing, and it's very difficult to do it in the context of this kind of changing background that I've tried to illustrate over the past few minutes. Well, sorry, that sounds like I have some sort of wisdom to impart. I'll just offer my observations and you can ignore them if you want. I think we have to try and block out the noise and do the work. And I know that's hard, and I know that's easy for me to say, because you're all out there talking to the public. I can lock my office door if I want. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so I, I do say this from a place of kind of profound respect. Uh, but I think to some extent, all this context is important, and I'm happy to discuss it, and I think we should discuss it. But these sort of storms blow up and they come and go. And if we try to respond to each of them or adapt to each one of them all the time, you can't do the work you need to do, which is trying to teach people about what this place is and what it means. That's complicated enough rather than worrying about what was on Fox News last night or MSNBC this afternoon. Because, and it's not your job to do that, even though I know that some guests may think it is or try to bait you. The other thing I would say, and this will come as a real shock to you, not all of our critics are necessarily good faith actors. <laughs> so they don't all want to actually have a discussion about whatever it is they say they want to have a discussion when they're trying to bait you. And my own view is, just like you shouldn't feed trolls on the internet, we shouldn't feed them in person. And I, again, I, I understand this is easy for me to say, but to some extent, I would say, ignore them. We don't have to take every argument. 
just as you don't have to respond to every post on social media that's directed at you or not, you don't have to take every argument. I know that's harder for you all because of the, the work you do, but we don't necessarily, so to some extent, I think we should try and block this out. So I'm kind of confident this, this is why this entire presentation is of dubious value to you because I'm not sure that my takeaway is, yeah, this is really interesting, Frank, that was great. Love the Chuck Norris slide, but there's nothing in it for us as guides. What's in it is, have faith in the work you're doing. It's important. We know that. We're here to help you. Certainly, ICJS is here to help you. But I think, at, to, to a large extent, keep try to block out the noise. If people want to have genuine discussions with you, that's different. And we don't all have to agree. And having difficult conversations is very Jeffersonian. It's what Monticello should be about, but they need to be civil discussions. And I know you all are civil, but if people are uncivil to you, you don't have to engage them. So if somebody comes to you and wants to talk about Jefferson style roundhouse kicks, I don't know what you do with it, but I'm, I don't think you're necessarily obliged to respond. But again, thank you for all you do. I'm happy to take questions. I left some time for questions, so let's, Let's talk. I'm listening. <laughs> Thank you. There it is. Now it is. OK. Yeah. yeah, we have to wait for the mic. Um, we're going to check to make sure we don't have any online questions, and then we'll take questions from the room. All right, this is from George Henry. What are your thoughts on the New York Post article that snowballed a year or two ago that was noise that seemed to really impact the Thomas Jefferson Foundation? Thank you, George. That's a very good question. And I would, uh, so I want to, I want to, before I respond to this, I want to make one thing clear. I wasn't working here then. So, Everything I have to say is Monday morning quarterbacking, and I wasn't here, and I have a huge amount of respect for colleagues who were here. So although, so, so you need to hear what I'm saying in that context, because it's, this is easy for me to say. It wasn't, easy, it wasn't easy for colleagues who were here last summer. That's frankly what I had in mind when I said we don't have to take every fight, and not all of our critics are, are necessarily acting in good faith. I think that was a bit of a hick job that then got picked up and amplified. And I'm not sure we should necessarily have responded beyond saying, you know what, we do a lot of good work here on, and we do a lot of good work on Jefferson and we do a lot of work on slavery. We're the best documented plantation um, in the country, but we're also a place, we, we are the center for the study of Thomas Jefferson and his legacy and that's, it's all part of it. Again, easy for me to say, so that this is, should not be heard as criticism of my colleagues um, who were here last summer because that was tough. I, I recognize that. But I think that's a that's exhibit A of the kind of culture war stuff that we as a public facing institution get dragged into or can get dragged into. But I think at, to some level, you know, we don't have to swing at every pitch. Although in this case, that wasn't a pitch. That was a, you know, that, that, was, that was a ball thrown straight at us. That wasn't... <laughs> Um, and, and I understand the urge to respond, but I'm not sure. I, I think responding in that case might have amplified things. But again, I don't. I want to make clear that you know I under, you know I appreciate that that was a very difficult situation. Thank you so much. We are going to be ending the live stream at this time. Thank you for joining us online. And if anyone has any questions here in the room, I will go ahead and bring the mic to you. So are we still recording though?